So for the past couple of weeks, Cortez, we here inside the PTFO newsroom, have been grappling with a particular dilemma. So there is a team of journalists out there, and I see them. They are working on something, all of them together. And what it is is they are working on why you've worn the same blue jacket every single time we've taped. It is a cardigan. It's it is not a jacket. It's been overworn. It has high thread count. You have not taken it home to wash it once. It is naturally resistant because of those fibers. Do you have any other cardigan or sweater type of outfit? I have many cardigans. I have a lot of knitwear. That is not the dilemma. It's not apparent. No. If you watch this show. Um, the dilemma we're here to discuss, and how dare you, how <laughs> dare you. It's a nice um, cardigan, I'm sorry, but you do wear it a lot. That's all I'm saying. The dilemma is far more pressing. This mm. sweater does not smell. Um, <laughs> the dilemma is how we're supposed to f***ing cover Taylor Swift. Mm. Right? The threadbare sweater of American media these days is talking about Taylor Swift because we should just say it for people who have been, I guess, in a coma for weeks now, Taylor Swift is dating Travis Kelsey. And it is the most overcovered, oversaturated, it's the most overdone story in all of American culture. Bro, I apologize. I was not listening to anything you just said because it just hit me. Like you and the cardigan, it's not unlike like a doctor like putting on like a lab coat or whatever it is they wear. And they're like, oh, now I'm a doctor. And they go in or whatever. You put that on when you walk in here like, I am now a journalist. I'm just trying to make my parents proud of me. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I was contemplating, I was contemplating truly like, how are we going to do this differently? How are we going to stitch together our own beautiful high thread count quilt that addresses the Taylor Swift story? And so I did notice one thing. 11th play of the drive, Mahomes walking in zone. There it is, a touchdown to Kelsey. This may be the first time in history that Patrick Mahomes isn't the most popular player in Arrowhead. <laughs> but Taylor Swift in the house, Travis Kelsey says, oh, baby. Now, if you are not watching on the DraftKings Network or on YouTube, um, what you cannot see there is Travis Kelsey, yes, Kansas City Chiefs tight end, scoring a touchdown. What you cannot hear there anywhere is what Taylor Swift is very obviously saying on live television in front of all of America, behind the glass of a luxury box, right next to Donna Kelsey, which is, let's f***ing go. And this mostly just went, like, unremarked upon, except by certain people. Here you have Taylor Swift, probably just met Travis Kelsey's mom for the first time. They're at the game last week, and she's going, let's effing go, well, no, right in but, front of her. But Travis Kelsey said that everybody in the booth that she was sitting in, all her, his family, uh, everybody said that she was so lovely. Lovely. Until, I'm sorry, if I heard that and, and my son was dating a girl has a mouth like a teamster, that's Whoa. it. <laughs> like a teamster. Bro, what's wrong with this Fox News guy? Like, let's f***ing go is everywhere. I've I've seen it in sports for a year. I see it everywhere. I yes. say it myself. Yes. That and and that part what you're saying here, profanity aside, that's the thing that hit me about this because you're completely right. Everybody everywhere all of the time all at once seems to be saying, "Let's go." Quarterbacks say it. College kids say it. I've seen Formula 1 drivers say it. NBA players say it. Teachers say it. Gamers say it all the time. What I wanted to find out is something that I have long been curious about myself. Why? Why is everyone saying this same phrase as if this is a meme that they're all forced to retweet? And it turns out you're not the only one with that question because when we put out the call for voicemails to our great listeners, it turns out one of them had a very similar question to that. Hey, Pablo, it's David from D.C. I was hoping to get the definitive story about how the phrase let's go became the de facto response to a big play in a sports game. Everywhere I look on TV, in local sports, that's all that's being said when something happens. It has just become the go-to phrase for all athletes when they do something big. How did that happen? Where did it come from? Thanks. Bye. 
I genuinely love our listeners. Right, I do too. Call 513-85-PABLO That's if you right. have more questions. Please, the assignment, that was amazing. The assignment inbox <laughs> is open. That's what I'm calling it. Um, but all of this really did feel like the universe itself was calling us to investigate this question, right? The question of who deserves the most credit for this phrase. And the good news is that I knew exactly which PTFO correspondent that I needed to go on this assignment. I'm thinking of the same guy. Yeah, chair bear. Oh God, fart bear. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Taché, we meet again. How old are you? I'm 28, Pablo. Just even the voice is already giving me PTSD. So <laughs> you're 28 years old. You're very young. You forced me to reckon with my mortality. And uh, you're bringing me back into the time machine. Because the last time I saw you, Jeremy, um, or at least the time that I cannot forget, it was April. The Miami Heat were playing the Milwaukee Bucks in the NBA playoffs. And I was hosting, sitting in Dan's chair, trying to direct a conversation among you Miami Heat propagandists. And in that conversation, suddenly, I heard you say this. Let's go! In that scenario, I was just trying to add a rightful punctuation to one of our beloved Heat propagandists in Ryan Parakeet Cortez, someone who obviously is beloved here at Pablo Torre finds mm -hmm. out. And to me, I felt like he just needed some support. To me, you felt like Wile E. Coyote over the canyon realizing that, oh yeah, this is, this is gonna go south real quick. Let's oh go! God. And we can play it one more time actually, just for, you know, just thoroughness. Let's oh go! The reason that I was saying it to begin with is because I was sort of following what athletes have been saying in moments like that. Forgive me, what athlete were you channeling there specifically? I think it would be unfair to name any specific <laughs> athletes in this scenario. I don't want to throw them under the bus. Well, there are lots of suspects. So that's the thing about this story is that you start to just peel the first layer back and you're like, this is omnipresent. Well, there are a ton of options, right? Like you have Nick Foles in the 2018 Super Bowl for the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's go! Let's go! You have LeBron James who will say it before games. Let's go! Yes, I've, I've heard Formula One drivers say it after uh, their races. Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> yes! Which means that both pregame and postgame, Athletes are using this, right? It, it kind of means everything. It's kind of like F at this point. It's a word that gets deployed to mean all sorts of things. Like it's a, it's a call to action as well as a celebration of the action you already had successfully completed. Yeah, it's shalom, essentially. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's one of those words where I, I, I don't know. I guess the, the part with let's go that's confusing to me is that I don't really remember it existing growing up. And, you know, you pointed out, I'm super freaking young. So it's not like there's been that much time for all of these phrases to evolve. And for us elder millennials, Jeremy, um, we are similarly confused. All we sort of know now is that the word cloud of American life, right, in 3,000 point font is let's go. And it's there now, it's hanging over us. And so this is why I came to you with an assignment, an actual journalistic task for a guy who is allegedly a reporter. You're catching us right now as the Miami Heat have just won game two of the NBA Finals. You can see that this crowd here is hoisting babies into the air. How did we get here? Like how does human speech in this way go viral? Who was the patient zero of this movement? It's a great question. And yes, I did spend weeks reporting this. I mean, we spoke to other journalists. We spoke to people within sports, people within entertainment. I mean, really, it, it kind of went across the board. And 
this goes beyond the 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 standard jumbotron calls of like let's go Yankees or let's go Mets. And I think that's the part that's kind of crazy. We were just talking about it, right? I don't remember it growing up. And I think that's my first takeaway from going down this rabbit hole wait, on this wait, assignment. Wait, 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 wait. So you went down the rabbit hole and you didn't find anybody there? I mean, if you're polling America, the obvious and easy patient zero would be Tom Brady. Are you ready? Let's go! Let's go, baby! When you see that, you're like, oh, right, of course. Of course, every bro in a quarter zip uh, sort of fleece, they're cosplaying as as Tom Brady, yes. Well, and that's the part, right? Tom Brady's supposed to be Mr. Let's Go. You know, he's been using this sort of elongated version of Let's Go, the one that we're talking about, the, the, the scream, the guttural version of it, since at least 2015 at the Patriots' victory parade. <laughs> I saw a viral clip from like a conference, I think. This was this was last month. A viral clip from a conference where Brady sort of took us um, inside the actor's studio on this. You've got to create a lot of different emotion to, to, to heighten your sense of awareness and focus. Like for me, anger was good. Anger was good because it was motivating. The more I could create an enemy, the more I wanted to go out and kill those guys. Now, I knew I wasn't going to kill him physically, but man, if I could just, what did they say? You know, and what did they look like? Did they disrespect me at all? You know, and did that asshole say something? Like, those are little, little, little things that can get me right in the emotional frame of mind that when I ran on the field and I said, let's fucking go. It was really, let's go kick some ass. That's what we were doing. That is the sound of people applauding a sociopath. I mean, that's what that sounds like. He literally was like, let me figure out what it's like to channel a serial killer. I'm not going to do it, but I want to get it. That's right. So who inspired Tom Brady to say this then? Like in your investigation, is everyone just like ceding intellectual property rights to that dude? No, absolutely not. Like that's not going to happen. And we'll get to the guy that, you know, really thinks he may very well be behind it. But I, I can tell you that it's not Taylor Swift as someone who is a, a resident Swifty around these parts at Metal Arc Media. Yeah. Uh, she does, hey, she does have a song, an unreleased song, mind you, called Let's Go. I need to stop you there, not just because um, I am worried that I don't know enough Taylor Swift stuff to actually be a working member of the sports media today, but also because I do want to turn our little sports journalism enterprise here into something of a trademark office. Because the question we're circling is like, who owns this phrase, right? Like, what's the standard here that we're using to determine who Mr. Let's Go or Mrs. Let's Go would be? So to me, standard number one was pretty simple. The Let's Go had to be organic. It couldn't feel forced. It couldn't feel performative. Right. It's got to come from that deep place inside of you, that guttural place that this is not something that I have planned. So like listening back to some of your previous episodes of Pablo Torre finds out, Russell Wilson started all of a sudden making his catchphrase, let's go, because he heard that Taylor Swift has been saying it. Well, you know, that, that wouldn't necessarily apply. Right, right, right. So Russ saying, by the way, Russ saying a lot, go Hawks in Seattle, that doesn't apply either because again, um, the letter of the law there, not exactly the same thing as let's go. Right, because for standard number two, the letter of the law wasn't enough, right? We want to talk about the sort of spirit of the rule as we continuously discuss how this is sort of an emotional thing. I think the spirit of the law matters here. And so the phrase, let's go, it's really been around forever, but it's usage, it's spirit. That's distinct. You need like, I don't know, at least seven O's in it. Right, 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 right. So again, not like this. Let's go! But like even more O's, even more uh, chutzpah, I believe. So what's the lineage here? Like where does this origin story actually begin? Even the great all-knowing Wikipedia 
uh, struggled to get all of the details right here. For example, Wikipedia claimed that there was a resurgence of a 70-year-old chant to a let's go, go, go White Sox that led to the uh, 2005 White Sox playoff run. Let's go, 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 go White Sox. We're with you all the way. You're always in their fighting hand. But, but, but 2005 absolutely would predate all of the internet stuff we're describing right now. Yeah, and, and that's part of why this story is wrong, because we reached out to catcher A.J. Pruszynski, who was on that team, a classic, a classic name in Major League Baseball. Of course. And uh, he told us via DM that that song uh, in 2005 was not really as much of a part of the White Sox World Series run as Don't Stop Believing" by Journey. When you talk about the real origin story of this phrase, it goes all the way back to the late 1500s. It turns out that Shakespeare had a line in A Comedy of Errors. Now let's go hand in hand, not one before another. Yeah, listening to that now, it does occur to me that you uh, are a little more Shakespeare than Tom Brady, Jeremy. Yeah, more, more Shakespeare than Tom Brady, I think, is how... Anyone who knew me in high school also probably would have described me. But a writer for Slate who we spoke to, uh, Luke Winky, he, he's also obsessed with this. Um, he traced that that Shakespeare line drew straight from there all the way to 1942. And that's when there was a recruitment poster for the U.S. Navy that read, Fight! Let's go! Join the Navy. Yeah, now we're getting, I think, significantly more macho in the evolution of the phrase. Yeah, well, the, the writer said the same thing, and he said that the militarization of this rally cry kind of gave it this communal masculinity, in a sense. And so this phrase, just to recap here, goes from Shakespeare to the U.S. Navy, out to, like, locker rooms, to stadiums, to the sidelines, to where? jukeboxes across America in the 1960s. Pablo, do you remember this clap? Of course, of course. I found out where it comes from. It's 1962's Let's Go Parentheses Pony by The Routers. And I was legitimately really excited to, to find this song because I think... As so many sounds that initially come from songs, no different than Seven Nation Army, which has become an arena staple, I don't think I realized that that clap and let's go came from musicians, came no. from a song. This is something I always just assumed was concocted for stadiums. And so the idea that this came from one place was really exciting. Right, well, now that I'm thinking about like the musical catalog here, there's that, and then there's the Ramones. Hey, oh. Right, and that was in 1976. And then the Cars had a song called Let's Go in 1979. Let's go. And then in 1986, the New York Mets had a song. Do it. Now this is the video for Let's Go Mets. This is essentially a hype video for the New York Mets in the middle of their season in 1986, a season that was going incredibly well, obviously led to them winning the World Series. And halfway through, they had this unbelievable idea to create a music video around a song called Let's Go Mets that had everyone chanting, let's go. So this thing, as someone who grew up, was born in the city, in New York City in 1985, this thing, when I watch it now for the podcast audience, what you're missing on our YouTube channel is, is essentially like a giant singing pile of cocaine. <laughs> Even watching it, you know, behind the scenes video on the VHS that we were able to find here, which that was a journey in itself. The energy behind it is crazy because you have you know, players juggling baseballs for the camera, blowing bubbles, and there's all sorts of extra shots that they had to get. Who the f are the people behind this? <laughs> 
So we spoke to the to the ad man who commissioned the video as well as the jingle writer who made the song. And he also directed the video. And what they told us was a, a ton of different information about what was going on behind the scenes here. First and foremost, the ad agency that was working with the Mets initially, they reached out to Billy Joel, to Elton John, to Stevie Wonder. And ultimately, they settled for someone who they had already worked with on previous jingles. So the ad man gives one direction to the jingle man. It better be f***ing great. <laughs> That's just good coaching. It is good coaching. It is good coaching. And the jingle guy told us that, and this is a direct quote, what can people get their head around with six beers in them? Right. And so that's sort of where right. this simple let's go, let's go, let's go starts up. You know, he had what no were comment. They on? What were they on, Jeremy? What were the players in the video on? He had no comment about whether or not the Mets, who were notorious party animals, were particularly on anything during the video shoot. But he said that the energy was up. It did sound like a lot of fun on set. I mean, there were notes of Ron Darling playing air guitar on a baseball bat. Keith Hernandez sat the director down and told him that initially the players were really excited about the song and making the video because they all thought they were going to be rock stars and make a million dollars a piece for some reason, which they did not. And what the director told me specifically is, quote, they all wanted to be rock stars. That was the level of childhood naivete. So this is what's going on is you have all of these players behind the scenes. It's amazing. But this director, I imagine that this director must look upon this work as the greatest of his entire career then. Well, he also wrote the jingle for the Meow Mix commercial. It could not have been a better thing for him to have done than write the Meow Mix commercial. <laughs> like, it's perfect. I am reeling now at the arc that you're tracing here, right? So we go from William Shakespeare to Meow Mix guy. And now, as I assess the English language, Jeremy, um, and you are a, a crypto Cuban, you're quietly... A Cuban American. Um, Crypto Cuban is great. Crypto, that's a new phrase I'm going to use all the time. I'm thinking of the Spanish language for that reason, right? And as a person who, who knows Spanish and marvels at how to do it better, I, I, would, I want to point out that like, vamos, vamos is a thing in Spanish. Vamos mm -hmm. literally means let's go. And that's been a thing forever. And vamos, when I think about what that word means versus... Um, what Meow Mix guy had the Mets doing, right? Like there is an edge to, there's an edge to Vamos. There's that Brady, the Tom Brady animosity to Vamos. And so which of the, uh, which of the English speaking artists that you surveyed here, um, who came closest to sort of replicating that specific quality? Well, for that, I believe there's only one answer. <laughs> The modern bard himself. Yes. Uh, how could I <laughs> <Yeah>. have forgotten? <laughs> I mean, come on. It's going to play at every single arena. You're going to hear it constantly. We did reach out to Lil John multiple times, um, but a humble guy himself. He refuses to come on oh. here and take credit for the origins of Let's oh. After the break, we figure out who deserves the throne that Lil John somehow abdicated. So I want to be intellectually honest here with you, Jeremy, because I think we're, we're, we're dealing with something that is legitimately tricky because what we're trying to do is solve the mystery of influence, right? And influence is not the same thing as being first. William Shakespeare cannot just, in the comment section of human history, say first. And so the question really is about who is the most influential and maybe even who is best. It reminds me of like the problem that advertisers and marketers are facing even in the age of the internet because our brains are so noisy. Our brains are so reluctant to um, assign credit for things. And so I feel like that's, that's a complication here that we got to reckon with who deserves credit. Look, Pablo, all of that is fair. Um, all of your intellectualism is appreciated. 
but, but I, I, I do think I found the guy who deserves the most credit. Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I remember this man. I want to describe this man, Jeremy, for our podcast audience. What is happening in that video that you just resurrected for me? Well, this video that you're watching is of Matthew Driscoll. And so Matthew Driscoll is the North Florida men's basketball coach. He's been there since 2009. But what's wonderful about the visual <laughs> of this Let's Go is you have a head coach who is approximately eight inches shorter than everybody else in the room. Yes, at least. Right off the bat. Wearing a white shirt and tie. <laughs> Okay, a white shirt and tie tucked into his dress pants. Facing away from everybody in the room. It's kind of an amazing reveal. Like you don't yes. see him at first. The team is walking away. And what's beautiful about it is you only see the team at first. You hear the let's go in the background, but you see the team and then slowly there's a bit of a pan and then a quick sharp zoom right into Matthew Driscoll, who's yelling at the top of his lungs. Pablo, he is my Mr. Let's Go. This was in the A-Sun title game in 2017. Of, of course, of course. Who could forget the 2017 Atlantic Sun title game? I believe the only Atlantic Sun title game to ever go viral. And I talked to Coach Driscoll this month. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me on. It seems like it was so long ago when in reality it was right around the corner. What of is this guy like in, in like actual human conversation? Well, he says he's been doing this basically forever in sort of a more punchy way, though. More of a, hey, let's go, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. That type of mentality. I'm a very, hey, let's go, hey, let's go, let's knock it out, let's go, let's knock it out, let's knock it out, let's knock it out, let's go, let's go. But then one day in 2015, during a conference semifinal, he let out a sound that I imagine sounds somewhat like this. What I have found out already in this episode, Jeremy, is who your exact opposite is, because that is the diametric inverse of this. Let's go! He is the greatest, and he is the king of the let's go, and I think he knows it, right? He loves when other people do it too, and he'll be the first mm. to judge, which I think is great. He's kept track of when LeBron said let's go. Let's go. He's kept track of when Bronny James has said let's go. He's kept the receipts. He judges, Pablo. He judges. Instead of America's Got Talent, I could be sitting up there. I don't know if you bent the knees enough. I'm not sure if your back, if your vocal cords were extended enough. I, I just really don't. I don't think you hit that note. The crescendo, it really didn't crescendo the way it should have. <laughs> the technique. The technique is what I am most impressed with now. Yeah, I mean, he has it down to an art form. I mean, literally, if you look at the video, he he's someone who he stands away from his players. He says he <laughs> always looks toward the wall as to not scream in anybody's face. He doesn't want to blow out their eardrums. Mm. Sometimes it has to be a let's go and then something doesn't go right, right? And then you have to kind of regroup. Let's go! You know, and then, so now you get a different ending. The breath is huge. Whether or not you have a vitamin C drop in your mouth is critical. The way in which you take that breath before the depth of the let's go in, the, in your body movement, because you don't want the diaphragm too, right, compacted, because you want it to be able to breathe back out. This man is a teacher. He is a master. He, he is truly incredible at this. No! Does he get recognized because of this? Like out in real life? Oh, yeah. I was at Marshall's the other day with my wife returning something. The guy said, I know that I know that voice center. I said, well, it's a good thing. No one ever says, man, I, I recognize your, your face. No, it's always like, I know that voice. Does being recognizable in this way, does that help him in his actual job? Does it help him, you know, recruit young people to play for the University of North Florida? Yeah, I mean, he said that in the middle of probably a half dozen different recruiting trips, there's been a, wait, 
hey, you're that guy from the meme, right? And he had a recruit that actually ended up, I believe, coming to the school who drew out a picture of him as the meme. He was a bit of an artist himself. <laughs> who drew, who drew so. the arched back, the vocal cords uncompacted, the diaphragm extended. Yes, the veins just popping There's out so of the neck. Veins. He drew it all. It was amazing. And and look, the, he says that the team has let's go offs, that he'll continue doing the let's go no matter the team's record because he wants to be able to show that this is kind of a fabric of the program. He's still doing it every game. Um, and one part that I think is awesome is that the school even has a sort of let's go competition during player warmups to hype up the crowd where oh fans God. come down from the stands with an opportunity to scream let's go. I mean, it's become marketing for the university at this point. He does keynote speeches, <laughs> conferences. It's unbelievable. It really I, is. I just want to say for the record, I unironically want to hire this man to do the keynote speech. I want to start a conference just to have a keynote speech where he does this. Let's go! He wants to be a proper influencer. I'll tell you that based off the conversation he suggested to me. And I, I kind of think he was only half joking. He said that his athletic department should get three tenths of a penny for every new view of the video. He's up to 385,000 and counting on YouTube alone. Mm. And that's not including any of the times I sent it in my group chat. I am now trying to piece this all together because you gave us two standards in the last segment for deciding who Mr. Let's Go ought to be. And number one, I believe, was that it needs to be organic. It needs to be coming from deep inside you. And this man feels like the Marianas Trench when it comes to where this is coming from. Let's go! So obviously, check on yes, standard number one. Absolutely. So number two, I think we... we <laughs> How many O's did you say we needed? I think it was seven. You're right. Okay, so uh, let's try and count this. Let's go! <laughs> Every time we play it, it feels like there are more O's attached. But yes, I think we're we're hammering the over on this one. Yeah, I think if we counted, we'd probably get closer to 700 than to seven. I, I, he smashes the over here. I think we're in good shape. So did you tell him, Jeremy, did you tell him on behalf of Pablo Torre finds out that uh, that we were deciding his place in linguistic history, that a coronation was was on the line in your interview? Yes, I did. I did tell him. I told him that he topped both Lil John and Tom Brady. And in turn, he actually coined his own new phrase. Well, first of all, that's a kind honor, and I want to say thank you. And second of all, I think when something's genuine, I think it certainly separates itself, and it allows it to be whatever it becomes. And so I'm not a Shakespeare. Um, I'm not a Longfellow. I'm not any of those, of those people. Uh, but I would say that I'm very honored um, that you would phrase it that way um, because, it, you know, that's a pretty good rapper and that's obviously the GOAT. So that's pretty, hey, maybe I could be the GOAT of the Let's Go. Wait, <laughs> is, he, is he saying that he is the Let's GOAT? I think he is. Look, Coach Driscoll is is still pretty decidedly pro Lil John in this narrative, but he legitimately thinks that he can take Tom Brady. It wouldn't even be a competition. And real, I'm serious. It wouldn't be. I mean, if you want to do this or do this real quick and get him on someday and get me on and then have a national vote to see he can bring Gronkowski with him, he can bring whoever he wants to bring with him. And, and, and let the best person win. Now, he can't use the explicitive because, you know, a lot more people are, in the secular population will be vote for him. So, Tom Brady, listen, Coach Matthews, Driscoll University in North Florida, apparently you and I both have a let's go that's been very, very popular over the years. We know you're the GOAT in football. But let's see. You and I, split screen, and let's let the nation decide who is the GOAT of the Let's Go! I 
I, I, this is this is me actually having to take my headphones off, like I that. That that actually did bust my eardrums. That is not a joke. He is uh, full of energy. You could say full of explicitives um, someone... as well, which I love. He said he's not Shakespeare. I disagree. I fully disagree. He's creating words. He's creating words. But hold on. I do need to admit something here, Jeremy, because the reason I went into this episode was because I had a very strong feeling that Let's Go was dead and that you specifically, you were the murderer, <laughs> that you had <laughs> killed it in April. And then when I saw Taylor Swift appear on national television in the most now famous game of the NFL season, um, I thought I was just watching her, you know, like just run a steamroller over all, what was already a corpse. And now, after having, uh, you know, my my cerebellum burst by Matthew Driscoll, I kind of got to admit that I I I want to see the Let's Goat prove that he is in fact the greatest of all time. I'm just already sort of concerned for society. As to what will happen if UNF ever runs off oh a match, March Madness tournament win, the levels of energy on that let's go from Matthew Driscoll <laughs> might. I think people would actually die. I think yeah, I, I think power plants possible. could be fueled by it and lives would be lost as a result of it. <laughs> but you do raise a good question here. And so I should ask for journalistic uh, thoroughness here. When Matthew Driscoll gave that iconic let's go, right? This is 2017. Um, mm -hmm. The one with a zillion O's that made him the greatest, the, the let's goat. Did they win that game? Uh, no. They lost by 16. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect. Um, Jeremy Tache, thank you for your reporting. Wait, am I allowed to real quick? Try to redeem myself no. with one final better let's go? No, no. But I have a feeling. Let's go! Okay. Please stop. Okay, at the end of this episode, I found out that I need to look inward at my own vocabulary because the number one phrase that I absolutely abuse and beat into the ground through sheer repetition is lol. You know, L-O-L, -L, lol, laughing out loud. Lol is all over my texts, and I always say lol ironically, obviously, because I would never be the type of person who says it sincerely. I say it as a parody of someone who would say it sincerely. I say lol all the time as a joke. But after hearing from the deafeningly sincere Matthew Driscoll and Jeremy Taché, I realized something important. If you say any phrase often enough, it can no longer be considered ironic. In fact, if you say any phrase often enough, it just becomes who you are. Lol. This has been Pablo Torre Finds Out, a Metal Arc Media production. And I'll talk to you next time.
All right, so the article that I'm bringing is a, a Hollywood Reporter article uh, about, it's kind of a short article based on Idris Elba doing a podcast where he talked about his workaholic nature and how mm. it, like, infests his life in a great deal. In my therapy, I've been thinking a lot about changing, almost to the point of neuro neuropaths being mm. changed and shifting. Mm. And it's not because I don't like myself or anything like that. It's just that I have some unhealthy habits that have just really formed. And they, you know, <clears throat> I work in an industry that I'm rewarded for those unhealthy habits. I'm rewarded for that, you know, whether it's to be selfish or to be, <clears throat> I'm a workaholic. I'm an absolute workaholic. And that isn't great for life, generally. Honestly, I, this was a reverse search. I wanted to talk about something, and I found any <laughs> article that was ten, loosely uh, tangential to my feelings <laughs> well, that's, about... That's the opposite of reporting. A reporter goes okay. in and doesn't know Who's what his reporter? story is. Well, you said, you, you huh. said that you wanted to talk about something, and you loosely tied it to an article to keep it to the flimsy conceit of we're bringing something here, but it's really just uh, Dominique now wants to talk about something. I'm bringing something here. I'm bringing beef. That's what I'm bringing here. here I'm bringing we go. beef with people who are my friends, but uh, Pablo specifically has been infected with content brain. <laughs> and it's it's ridiculous. The thing is, the workaholic nature of Pablo and many people like him is weird because being a workaholic, as Idris Alba puts it, and he's an actor, is one thing. And it's dangerous for him to go and leave his family and go work on a movie and develop a whole brand new family and then cut it off and then go go back to be with your family. Like, I understand that in general, traditional workaholics, I can understand how it could be detrimental on your life in ways that aren't connected to your job. But what I've found with some of my friends, Pablo specifically, is that it's so detrimental to your life that it infects the way that you treat everybody and the relationships you have with people where... Pablo and I used to talk. We used to text. Now, the only time I hear from Pablo <laughs> is him trying to get me on this stupid-ass show. By the way, I got a stupid-ass show, too. Dude, we going to promote that? You ever been on my stupid-ass show? No. Let's preserve our relationship. I do Everything some of the same. Not about I've done, making I've done, shit. I've done some of the same things to you. Dominique has dragged me back a couple of times. Where it's like, Don't hey, you can, hate it, though? Can, can we just I'm be glad friends? Dan's well, wait in a here minute. too. Finally. It saves me the step. Yes, it's not fair. It's not fair to Dominique. But what has happened here, and I think this is super interesting and you will recognize it, Pablo sees in front of him an opportunity of a lifetime to make something specifically tailored to his life specific specifications as a career in his voice and personality for the rest of his life to raise uh, Violet and to and, yep. and to give a great life to his family. And, and the obsession of the opportunity, you're going to say, is a lack of balance that makes him, you know, rationalize that he's buried in work and not tending to things at home that a workaholic has to... Uh, also pay attention to, but I recognize it because what's funny about, not only do I recognize it, I'm actually proud of part of lopsided Pablo because he used to be lazy. I saw when he was lazy. I saw when he didn't care about something that it was his own, that he was fooling around on television and it was easy for him as cotton candy. I saw when he wasn't making his own thing, how he, he could be your friend in a way that wasn't worried about the content, but now he's got his own risk, his own opportunity, his own grown up responsibilities. And so it becomes an obsession because it has to succeed. So for for, okay. for, for just hold well, on, hold well, on, hold the f on. No, nah, I just no, 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 no. You hold. You uh oh, on. So, this isn't the Dominic. Uh -oh. I don't give a shit that this is digital. I'll see you again. I'll see you again. Uh -oh. So let my traditional masculinity step you down. Oh, no. I'm just gonna make a question. Try to improve your okay. show. Okay. All right, so, Pablo. Write down what you were gonna say and let him be the alpha. Right, let me you take out my notebook. <laughs> Am I am I the devil on your shoulder or the That's, angel on your shoulder? You're stealing my point. Dan you're is steal definitely okay, one. Okay, so Dominique and I, unfortunately... I'm stealing and I did it better. I have quicker. like a, a double efficient. entendre metaphor here because what you just did was obviously sync your content brain, which you deny having with my content brain, which wanted to point out that if you're watching this on the DraftKings Network, or on my YouTube channel. Pablo Torre finds out. No, my show, Dominique Foxworth Show. We're on YouTube at ESPN. On, also, follow my podcast. It's on the one gross. shoulder. You know it's gross. <laughs> on the one gross. shoulder is Dominique is Foxworth, gross. alleged it angel. And on the other side is Dan Lebetard, oh. the content-brained devil who is 
texting me encouragement because he sees how obsessed I am with making my show better. Don't animate this shit. You better not animate <laughs> this shit. And my point about Dominique and the merging of our content brains is that there is nothing more content brain than turning content brain into content. That is what you, sir, have done here today. And so this is what this was your big get. You knew I was gonna bring your content brain. You just couldn't wait to try to act like you turned it on me. You didn't no, turn it on me. No, what I'm saying is that you have content brain aspirations and you're I afraid I to give in. I don't. You're afraid to give in, Dominique. He's afraid. I'm not and afraid to give in. I'm not afraid to he, give in. Well, this is interesting. I, let me start, let me start if I may, Alpha. If I may, <laughs> just I, I, from, proceed, sir. From over here, I do believe Dominique has an incredible life balance. He is good about putting his priorities where they belong, and when he needs to be get to present. The, get to the shot. Get, when, get no, to the insult. When he I don't needs, need all no, the butter. No, up. when he needs <laughs> to be present, he is present. However, I believe that notebook mm. would reveal evidence of content. Brain. That's right. I believe that that notebook is you carrying around ideas for what you want to do that might come to you in a moment. Why are you carrying around that notebook? Because I need to write down notes. It's not about the show. It's not content brain. It has nothing to do with any of that. You wish that you had a big gotcha <laughs> moment, but it's not a big gotcha moment. I did. No, no, I did no, no. I'm not I giving up on this gotcha moment that, yet. I okay. just, no, Dominique, this is, this is what we're dealing with is Dominique trying to have it both ways. I'm yes, not. and I'm, I, not. I'm just telling you. I'm just okay. telling you. As 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 your friend who will admit that I've been a worse friend because I've been afflicted with late onset content brain, is that I have noticed that you want to do some stuff in the world of writing, in the world of media, in the world of entertainment that is wildly ambitious, and. Don't don't say I want to do stuff like I don't get that shit done. He's Bob. doing it. I do <laughs> he's doing it. Everything I want to do, it gets all done. Right. All right, he's all doing right, it right now. Proper respect. But, Go ahead. But this is this is my point: is that what you see as content brain is my evolutionary adaptation to try and get stuff done, and you're doing it in a way okay. that is, I think, in this way, it is less honest than guy who oh. is worse at texting oh. now. Because you're in the shadows this doing is, stuff. You know. Dishonest. You know, the point that I am making <laughs> to you, Pablo, and the reason why I yell at you and even uh, Dan sometimes too about the content brain is not because I think that it is all bad because I do believe nothing is all bad and nothing is all good. The fact of the matter is you're lying to yourself and you're trying to justify it and pretending like you're not aware that there is a cost for it. You're not going to lose me as a friend. I'm going to be your friend. But be honest with what you're doing. You are paying a price too. That's all I want you to know. I also think, though, I think if I can, uh, and he's not going to let me have this one either. I do believe, though, that Dominique thinks himself, and rightly in most instances, so singularly unique that nothing would afflict him exactly the same way it afflicts you and me, Pablo. That he would. Oh, of course, what he wants that, you that to he think. Would, Dan, he would be a, you he are would such be a above patsy, it. Dan. How is it that you fall for this handsome? No, he didn't say that. You're such a bad listener. He said that's what Dominique wants him to think. He's not saying that he thinks that also. Shut up, host man, and let the man talk. Proceed, Dan. Yeah, I just, I believe that he thinks himself so unique, and I've seen a lot of yeah, evidence of him thinks. actually being balanced, actually having his priorities in order, actually measuring success different than other workaholics I have met. He wants to succeed. He wants to achieve. He's confident he can do those things, and he is doing those things. I just think he wants you to think and us to think that he comes by that as easily as he did his Harvard business degree and cornerback in the NFL, that it was effortless for him. It was not an addiction. It was a choice because this man is so alpha, he is not controlled by any of his addictions. There it is. Don't forget that I, I've, I've written on scripted television shows, too. I do it all. That's what That's I was referring I said to. I wanted to. That's what I was it's easy. Done. Yeah. That's the I know, key to being but, cool. But it's why we'll it, never be but cool. But Dan left it out. But Dan left <laughs> it's, it out. But it's so why we'll never include. be cool because we can't, we can't be, uh, we can't be as confident as you. It's just not, so it's not possible. The, the, it's not that, so I recognize if we're going to be honest here and I'll, I'll drop the, the alpha man performance for you. Yeah, I've come to a different place than you. It may not be a better place, but what happened was I had made enough money and it's like a retirement age experience that I was fortunate enough to have in my late 20s that most people never have or don't have till late in life. I imagine that before Dan started this company where he also, along with the 
the pressure of having a successful company carries with it the pressure of succeeding for your friends because they don't have the security that Dan has.